Hello everyone, and welcome to these virtual lectures on quantum condensed matter physics. I'm Dr Andrew Mitchell, and in this lecture we'll be considering the fundamental physics of so-called quantum spin chain models. In the first part of the lecture, we're going to consider the famous Ising model. We will look at a one-dimensional model of quantum spins, but where the coupling is only through the Z component of the spin operators. We will see that uh, the, the eigenstates of this system are product states, they're basically non-entangled classical states. If we put a longitudinal field along the z-axis, we will see that the physics doesn't really change that much. However, in a transverse field, where the magnetic field is in a different direction from the direction uh, along which the spin-spin coupling happens in the chain, we will see that we get entangled states. The eigenstates are superpositions of the product states, or it can be viewed as superpositions of classical states. We'll look at the physics of these models We'll talk about the ferromagnetic states and antiferromagnetic states for different signs of the coupling. We'll talk about the effects of the magnetic field and quantum phase transitions. In the second part of this lecture, I want to explore um, a concept known as the quantum to classical correspondence. This is where we can view a quantum system at a given temperature in terms of a classical system in one higher dimension at a different temperature. There is an analogy between these systems and the analogy is made precise when we consider the statistical mechanics of these systems and really compare the partition functions. We will do this in this lecture explicitly for a zero-dimensional quantum system, which is basically just a single spin, and a one-dimensional classical spin problem. We will show explicitly uh, what the form of the, um, of the partition functions for these two systems are, be able to compare them and show that they're actually the same. This will allow us to establish the quantum to class classical correspondence for this system and we'll talk about it in, in more general terms in this lecture. So let's get down to work. So in this lecture and in the coming lectures, we'll be discussing some of the underlying physics for quantum condensed matter systems involving many spins. This makes a bit of a departure from what we've been considering in the previous lectures, where we focused on uh, systems with just a few spins. Now we're going to look at the so-called thermodynamic limit, where we consider an infinite lattice of spins. In this lecture, we're going to focus on quantum spin chains. We'll consider infinite systems, but only in one dimension. We're going to take a look at two classic examples. The first is the quantum 1D Ising model, and the second is the 1D Heisenberg model. So first we'll start with the Ising model in 1D. I've written down the Hamiltonian here, and you see that it's actually a very simple Hamiltonian. We imagine that we have a chain of n spins, those spins are labelled by i, and the index i runs from 1 to n. If we want to look at the thermodynamic limit, we can simply take n goes to infinity. We'll consider that later. This is a quantum mechanical Hamiltonian. You see I have a Hamiltonian h hat here, the hat denoting the quantum mechanical operators. And on the right hand side, I have a quantum mechanical spin half operators, s i z and s i plus 1 z. This s i z is a, an operator which can be written in this projector form here. It's simply giving me the z projection of a spin half particle located on site i. So there's a few things to notice right away from this Hamiltonian. First of all, we have uh, couplings between only nearest neighbor spins. You see here that we have the coupling between spin i and i plus one. We also see that we have the same coupling strength, uh, j, between all nearest neighbor pairs. Finally, uh, we see from this Hamiltonian that the coupling is only through the z component of the spin. This Hamiltonian only involves the sz operators. We notice here that the Hamiltonian has a full SU2 symmetry. Although the coupling is only through the z components of the spin, uh, the choice of our z-axis is arbitrary, and we still have the full SU2 symmetry of rotations. The quantum mechanical spins here are vectors which are of magnitude s equals a half, but of course SZ tells us the Z projection of that spin, which can be around an arbitrary Z axis. This is in contrast to classical spins, which are discrete variables. They're just pointing up or down, plus or minus a half. This is a Z2 symmetry. Although we label the Z projection of our quantum mechanical spins as plus or minus a half, remember that the Z axis itself is arbitrary, and we still have the full rotational symmetry in three-dimensional space. Later on in the lecture, we'll discuss in more detail the correspondence between the quantum model and the corresponding classical model. 
also notice that the Hamiltonian commutes with the operators S i z for all sites i. This is easy to verify, and I suggest you try this yourself. This is very important because it tells us that we can form a simultaneous eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian with each of the S i z operators. This means that the S i z's are basically quantum numbers, and we can label not only our basis states by S i z, but also the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian by the set of quantum numbers S i z. The Hamiltonian h hat does not change the value of S i z in a given basis state. It's a conserved quantity, and therefore S i z is a quantum number. We can therefore label our basis states in the following way, by a single ket, with quantum numbers S one z, S two z, S three z, and so on, all the way up to S n z for an n particle system. If we run over S i z is plus or minus a half for each of the n spins, we'll totally enumerate our basis. Our basis therefore consists of two to the n states. These basis states are product states. This ket is a shorthand notation for the following object, which involves the direct product of the complex vector spaces for each of the sites. We have a quantum number S1z, which is plus or minus a half, describing the z projection of spin number one, and similarly S2z is the z projection of spin number two. We can write down a given product state in terms of the direct product of the states of the individual set spins, one, two, three, and so on, all the way up to n. These kind of product states are basically classical states. What I mean by this is that there's no entanglement between the different spins in these product states. This follows from our discussion in the previous lecture of the entanglement entropy, which we calculated from the reduced density matrix. There we saw directly that if one has such a product state, then there is zero entanglement entropy between spins. Entanglement is the key feature which distinguishes uh, quantum states, which can in general be superpositions of basis states, from classical states, which are always product states like this one. So when I refer to these as like classical states, I mean that they have zero entanglement. The important thing, as we will now see, is that these product state basis states are in fact eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. If we were to apply h hat to one of these basis states, we'd see that we get the state back again, times an eigenvalue, which is a pure number, this is the energy of that state. This object here involves quantum numbers s i z and s i plus 1 z. These are the same s i z and s i plus 1 z's as appear in the ket here. These are not operators, we don't see any hats here, they are simply the quantum numbers for a given state. So we've actually found the solution of this model. These classical product states are in fact eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. Every single product state of this form uh, is an eigenstate, and it has a specific energy that we can simply write down once we know all of the quantum numbers. So in this case, we didn't have to do anything to solve the Schrodinger equation. Because all of the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian are these product states, this means that none of the eigenstates have any entanglement at all. We can therefore expect that this Ising model will give us essentially classical physics. So with the eigenstates and energies now at hand, let's explore some of the physics of this model. So just to recap, we have a Hamiltonian operator, which takes this form for the 1D Ising model. We have eigenstates, which are these product states labeled by the quantum numbers S1z, S2z, and so on and then the corresponding energies of these states, and I'm labeling the energies here by the same quantum numbers, is simply j times the sum upon i of sij, si plus 1z, and these are the quantum numbers, these same sij, si plus 1z's are just numbers, which are the things that appear on the left-hand side of this equation here. They're not operators, which have hats, as we have in the Hamiltonian. So this is a completely solved model. Let's have a look at the lowest energy state, or the ground state, in the case when j is less than zero. It's easy to see that the ferromagnetic state has the lowest energy. A ferromagnetic state is one with all of the spins aligned in the same direction. For example, as I've written here, we could imagine the state up, 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 and so on. The ups continue on forever. This ferromagnetic state is, of course, an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, as we showed earlier, and it's easy to see that this is the one with the smallest energy. This is because each pair of neighboring sites has the same spin projection. 
that means that when I take the product here between uh, neighboring uh, spin projections, I will get a positive number. If we have uh, an up spin next to an up spin, this product here will give us uh, plus one half times plus one half equals plus one quarter. Indeed, I get the same result, plus one quarter, for every pair of spins in the entire system. The overall energy of this state, therefore, is n times j over 4, where n is the number of sites in the system. If j is less than 0, then this will be the largest negative number that we can form for the energy. And that's, of course, the ground state. However, that's not quite the end of the story, because I can think of other states that have the same lowest energy. Consider, for example, the ferromagnetic state with all spins aligned, but now they're all pointing down. The state looks like this, with spins down, 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 and so on, going on forever. In this state, the z projection of each spin is minus a half. But the product of SZ on a pair of neighbouring spins is minus a half times minus a half is again plus one quarter. Overall, then, the total energy of this state is n times j over 4. The ferromagnetic state with all spins pointing up has the same energy as the ferromagnetic state with all spins pointing down. Of course, we should have anticipated this because of the overall SU2 spin symmetry of the problem. We can choose an arbitrary axis along which we measure the z projection of the spin. In particular, we can choose the positive z direction to be pointing up or pointing down. We can therefore replace all of the ups in the system by the downs in the system, and we will get the same result. But the continuous rotational symmetry should imply that we have a whole manifold of ground states, not just the ferromagnetic states up or down that I've drawn here, but some arbitrary ferromagnetic state with the spins all aligned but pointing in some arbitrary direction. The SU2 symmetry implies that all of these states would have the same lowest ground state energy, nj over 4. Because the up-up-up state and the down-down-down state are both eigenstates of the Hamiltonian with the same energy, it means that I can form any linear combination of them that I like, and that will also be an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. Let's therefore define this arbitrary linear combination as a ferromagnetic state with a new z-axis that's pointing in some arbitrary direction, which is defined relative to the old z-axis uh, with the angles theta and phi. So something like I have depicted here, with theta and phi being a polar and an azimuthal angle. And then we can define these angles theta and phi um, in terms of our complex numbers in the coefficients here, a and b. The angle theta is uh, relating to the relative magnitudes of the coefficients a and b, and the angle phi is relating to the relative phase of the complex numbers a and b. For example, if a and b were both real numbers, then we'd find immediately that phi was equal to pi by 2, 90 degrees. Let's suppose further that a was equal to 1 and b was equal to 0. This would give us the ferromagnetic state with all of the spins pointing up, the up-up-up state. In this case, we would see that theta was equal to 0. By contrast, if b was equal to 1 and a was equal to 0, then we'd have the down-down-down state. And in that case, we'd find that theta was equal to pi. So here, a and b are complex numbers that parameterize our linear combination, uh, but they're actually also related in a physical way to the axis around which we're measuring the z projection of the spin. And I'm defining that in terms of these angles theta and phi. So by taking these linear combinations, we can form new eigenstates, which are still to be regarded as ferromagnetic states, with all of the spins aligned in a certain direction. It's just the axis is now changed. The axis along which the spins are aligned in this linear combination is related to the z-axis uh, by these angles theta and phi here. Let's now consider the other case when j is positive. What is the ground state of our system now? By very similar logic to before, we can now see that the antiferromagnetic Neal state, in which all pairs of uh, spins on neighbouring sites are antiparallel, this one is now the lowest energy state. If we take the product of the z-projection of the spin on a given site i, and multiply it by the z-projection of the spin on the neighbouring site, i plus 1, 
we'll see that this product is always minus a quarter. For example, on this pair, we see plus a half times minus a half is equal to minus a quarter. Whereas if we look at this pair, we would see uh, minus a half times plus a half. So in the antiferromagnetic Nael state, which goes up, down, up, down, up, down, and so on, we would find that uh, we have minus a quarter times j for each pair of uh, nearest neighbor spins. And we sum over all n spins in the system, and we have a contribution minus nj over 4. So in the case when j is positive, this favors the antiferromagnetic state, because this is now the state with the largest negative energy. So if j is negative, we favor the ferromagnetic state, where all spins are parallel. And if j is positive, we favor the antiferromagnetic state, where all neighboring spins are antiparallel. And of course, the up, down, up, down, up, down state is degenerate with the down, up, down, up, down, up state. These both have the same lowest energy minus nj upon 4. And in exactly the same way as before, we can take any arbitrary linear combination of these two states, and that will also be an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. So when we talk about the ferromagnetic state and the antiferromagnetic state, we're really regarding these to be a family of solutions. This is, of course, something that is distinct from uh, the classical case, when you would literally just have two solutions. Here we have a continuum or, or a family of solutions parameterized by these continuous variables. One way of characterizing the difference between the ferromagnetic and the antiferromagnetic states is through um, their correlation functions. Both of these states uh, have long-range order, but the nature of that order is very different in the ferromagnetic than in the antiferromagnetic case. Consider the following correlation function. 4 times the expectation value at t equals 0 of Sizz times Si plus Dz. D here uh, tells us the separation between the two spins that we're measuring the z component on. And what we find in the ferromagnetic state is that this is equal to plus 1 independently of D. If I were to choose D equals 1, I'd be looking at neighboring spins, and we would see that they have the same uh, Sz. And therefore, I would, of course, get uh, a half times a half is equal to a quarter times 4 is equal to plus 1. But this actually holds for any D. If I were to look at uh, d equals 100, for example, then I would be looking at a pair of spins separated by 100 sites. And if it was a ferromagnetic state, I would be sure that both of those spins would have the same Sz, giving me this value of the correlation function plus 1. This is referred to as long-range order because d can be anything here. I could even make this very large, like a million, and I would still know exactly the result of the, the z projection for one spin if I knew it for the other. On the other hand, if I look in the antiferromagnetic Nael state, I see something a bit different. The value of this correlator is either plus or minus 1. It's plus 1 if uh, d is equal to an even number, and it's minus 1 if d is equal to an odd number. For example, if d was equal to 1, then I'd be looking at neighboring spins, and in the antiferromagnetic state, if I look at neighboring spins, then we know they are antiparallel. But again, this is not just short range order, but long range order. Any odd d would give me a value of minus 1, because I know that any pair of spins separated by uh, an odd number of sites uh, would be antiparallel. And any uh, pair of spins separated by an even number of sites would be parallel. So this is the way to characterize the ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic states. In particular, these expectation values will be independent of our choice of z-axis. So even though it might not be completely obvious from a particular linear combination of these states, whether or not we have a ferromagnetic or an antiferromagnetic or even some arbitrary state, these uh, correlation functions will tell us uh, what kind of order we have in the system and whether it is long range or short range. Both of these cases have infinite long-range order. In a general case, as we'll see later, we might see systems for which we have um, the correlation functions decaying with distance. If we consider neighboring spins, we see a strong correlation, but as we get further and further away, the correlation gets weaker and weaker. In the present example, we see that's not the case. Both ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic states, as I've drawn them here, 
are uh, indeed long-range ordered states. The value of both of these correlation functions is independent of the separation between the spins, d. I now want to consider a variant of this model, the quantum 1D icing model in a longitudinal magnetic field. In the first term of the Hamiltonian I've written down here, we have the icing model as I wrote it down before, with a coupling between nearest neighbour spins on sites i and i plus 1, and the coupling is just through the z component of the spin. Now I've introduced a second term, which is a magnetic field, h, coupling to the z component of spin i. In this system, we still have that the operators corresponding to the z component of the spin on site i commute with the Hamiltonian. This is true for all sites i. This again means that we can label eigenstates of our Hamiltonian according to the set of quantum numbers s i z. These product states that I've written down here are therefore eigenstates of the Hamiltonian with a corresponding energy E that depends just on the quantum numbers S1Z, S2Z, S3Z, and so on. The energies take this explicit form with the quantum numbers SIZ. Note that these objects here are quantum numbers, they're just numbers, plus or minus a half for each object. Uh, they're not operators, which are denoted with the hats in the Hamiltonian here. Because we have this extra term corresponding to the longitudinal magnetic field, we see a correction to the energy that depends on the value of the spin. Because we have a coupling to a magnetic field, which is along a specific direction, in this case the z direction, the degeneracy of the eigenstates in our family of solutions is now lifted. Let's take another look at the j less than zero ferromagnetic case. If we look at the up, up, up ferromagnetic state, then it has an energy of nj over 4, corresponding to the coupling between the two neighbouring spins, minus nh over 2, corresponding to the coupling of each spin to the magnetic field. The down, down, down state is also an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, but its energy is now nj over 4 plus nh over 2. So the magnetic field in the longitudinal direction has lifted the degeneracy between these states. We now have, in fact, a unique ground state. It is this one, the up, up, up state, because this is the one where um, we ex maximize the correlation energy between neighboring spins, that's the J, and also all of the spins are aligned with the magnetic field. That's giving this additional contribution, minus NH over 2. So the field lifts the degeneracy, and gives us that the up-up-up state is now the unique ground state of the system. What about the case when j is greater than zero? This was where we found the antiferromagnetic solution on the previous slide. Let's consider the Neal states up-down-up-down-up-down and so on, as well as down-up-down-up-down-up and so on. These states actually remain degenerate in the presence of the field. That is because the correction to the energy of these states due to the magnetic field cancels from all of the upspins and the downspins, and that happens in both cases. Another way of saying this is that the energy of these eigenstates involves the sum over i of minus h s i z. The magnetic field is coupling to the total s z of the system. The total s z of these antiferromagnetic states is equal to zero, and so we don't see a correction to the energy of these states. So are these states still the ground states? Well, we have to be a bit careful. It is possible that if we apply a large enough magnetic field, then one of the ferromagnetic states will cross over and become the ground state, even though j is greater than zero. That is because these ferromagnetic states gain the most stabilization energy from being parallel to the magnetic field. Let's now look at the energy difference between the ferromagnetic state and the antiferromagnetic state in the magnetic field for a given value of j. We find that this energy gap is given by n over 2 into j minus h. This implies that we can have a crossing of the ground state when j is equal to h. That's when the energy gap closes and delta e is equal to 0. So let's say that the magnetic field is positive and the j is positive. When j is equal to h, we have a crossing over from an antiferromagnetic ground state to a ferromagnetic ground state. This is referred to as a quantum phase transition. It's actually a first-order transition. It happens when j is equal to h in this case, 
and it basically corresponds to a crossing over of the ground state. A quantum phase transition is a phase transition that happens at the absolute zero of temperature on tuning some other parameter, not the temperature. Here we see that the uh, quantum state of the system changes discontinuously at j equals h. We go from anti-ferromagnetic correlations to ferromagnetic correlations. In this case, the total magnetization of the system is a macroscopic observable. Uh, it's the order parameter in this case, and it gains a finite value as soon as we enter the ferromagnetic phase. We'll be discussing quantum phase transitions a lot more in the coming lectures, so we don't have to worry about that too much just at the moment. I now want to touch upon the much more complex and interesting physics of the quantum 1D icing model in a transverse magnetic field. The Hamiltonian looks very similar to the ones we've considered previously. We have a sum over spins, i from 1 to n, and we have the icing term, which is the spin-spin coupling along the z-direction of neighbouring spins i and i plus 1, with a constant interaction j. And then we have our coupling to the magnetic field. This time it's a transverse magnetic field because we see that the magnetic field is coupling to the x component of the spins rather than the z component of the spins. This might seem like a rather modest change. Previously we had a magnetic field pointing in a particular direction and now we have the magnetic field pointing in a different direction. But this turns out to be a very crucial difference. For a longitudinal field, the field was aligned along the same direction as the spin-spin coupling, uh, whereas here it's uh, perpendicular. This is an important difference because we can express the SIX operator in terms of our spin raising and lowering operators SI plus and SI minus for a given side i. This term therefore allows us to have quantum spin fluctuations the spins can flip on a given site because of the coupling to the magnetic field. We also see a big difference on the level of the operator algebra. The operators SIZ, which we were using previously to label eigenstates of our system, now no longer commute with the Hamiltonian. The origin of this, of course, is the SIX term in the Hamiltonian, and we know that we cannot measure simultaneously the X and Z components of our spin. The commutator of SIX with SIZ is related to SIY. It's not simply equal to zero. This means that the SIZ operators do not commute with the Hamiltonian, and this means that the SIZs are no longer good quantum numbers. We can label basis states according to SIZ, but eigenstates of the Hamiltonian can no longer be labeled by the individual SIZs. In particular, our old product states, which were previously eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, now in the transverse magnetic field, no longer solve the Schrodinger equation. Let's take the ferromagnetic state with spin configuration up, 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 and so on. If I act with the Hamiltonian on this state, then I can expand this as the following two terms. Firstly, the spin-spin coupling term, uh, parameterized by J, acting on the state, and then the spin-flip term due to the transverse magnetic field acting on the state. We know that in the first term, we simply get nj over 4 times the state back again. But in the second term, we see something much different. The si plus operator acting on this state will always annihilate it because we can't raise any of the spins uh, any further, they're all pointing up. But that's not true of the SI minus operator. This can lower the spin from an up to a down on a given site i, and of course we're summing over all sites. So therefore, in the second term, we obtain a superposition of states where one spin is flipped. And so on. So on the right-hand side, we see this whole zoo of terms, uh, which are almost the ferromagnetic state, but with one spin flipped to its down position, and it's the sum over all possible combinations. The down spin can be located on the first site, or the second site, or the third site, and so on, all the way up to the end of the system. So of course, the ferromagnetic state cannot be an eigenstate of this system. From this kind of analysis, we can guess that the true eigenstates of the system will be complicated linear combinations of these kind of product states.
This would also imply that the solutions to our uh, Schrodinger equation, the eigenstates of our quantum 1D icing model in a transverse magnetic field, are superpositions and they're entangled states. They are not the same kind of classical product states as we saw for the icing model in a, in a longitudinal magnetic field. So we've seen here directly that there's a big difference between the icing model in a longitudinal field and in a transverse field. The latter is much more complicated and we have genuine quantum superposition states which are entangled. The question now is, what are the eigenstates of this system and how do we find them? Actually, this is in general a very hard problem. We can proceed, as in the previous lectures, by constructing the Hamiltonian matrix for a system with a finite number of spins and simply diagonalizing it to find the, uh, the wave functions. This is equivalent to solving the Schrodinger equation, but it does mean that we have to construct a 2 to the n by 2 to the n Hamiltonian matrix for a system of n particles and then to diagonalize that matrix. This is a very hard problem, especially when n becomes large. And they're the kind of systems that we're interested in, usually in condensed matter physics. So it turns out that the quantum 1D icing model in a transverse magnetic field is a difficult problem. The numerical solution of this model for systems with a finite number of spins um, is part of one of the assignments for the UCD students. We will be discussing the physics of the transverse field icing model in a future lecture in detail, uh, where we'll talk about the, the numerical solution and uh, we'll see directly the quantum phase transition that happens as a function of the magnetic field strength h. In the second part of the course, we'll actually return to this problem in the context of the jordan wigner transformation, where we'll see that we can actually transform the transverse field icing model uh, into a model of free fermions. This allows the model to be solved in a rather powerful way. Needless to say, the resulting physics of the transverse field icing model is rather more subtle than the icing model without a field, or even a field in the longitudinal direction. But I won't say too much more about it here. The next model I want to review briefly is the Heisenberg spin model in one dimension. We studied the Heisenberg exchange coupling between a pair of spin half particles in a previous lecture. Now we extend this to a chain of spin halves in one dimension. The Hamiltonian has this rather simple looking form, I have a spin-spin coupling involving these vector operators here between sites i and i plus 1. Again, just neighbours in one dimension. I have n spins in total. I have a constant exchange coupling j between each uh, neighbouring pair of spins. I can write this out into um, a term involving the coupling along z and then the spin-flip terms. The term we were just considering in the icing model was basically just this coupling along the z direction. So I can regard the part of the Heisenberg spin model that involves the coupling along z to be the icing model. We know that if it was just this term, we would have the classical product states as our solutions to the Schrodinger equation. However, in the Heisenberg model, we also have these spin flip terms. These are, of course, not just the same as our transverse field, um, which involved a single si plus and si minus operator. Here we have spin flip terms, and these terms act on a neighbouring pair of spins. So for example, if I have an up-down configuration, this term will flip it to the down-up configuration, and so on. So these spin-flip terms basically encode the quantum mechanical fluctuations, which sit on top of the uh, classical product states arising from the icing term. So we would expect, again, the physics of the Heisenberg spin model to be much more complicated and involve quantum mechanical superpositions of states in its solution. This is a very complex model with a rich range of physics. Actually, in one dimension, it is exactly solvable, but one has to use very sophisticated means, for example, the thermodynamic beta ansatz. In general, these spin systems are strongly correlated. They are many-body problems and not straightforwardly solvable. But let's have a look at some of the basic physics of this system. First, let's look at the ferromagnetic case with j less than zero. We know this tends to favour high spin configurations. In this case, the ferromagnetic state, with, for example, all the spins aligned in the up direction, is actually an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. We can see that directly. Simply apply the Hamiltonian operator h hat to this state, and we'll see that the spin flip terms here cannot operate on this state because it's saturated uh, in its magnetization with all of the spins pointing up 
we can't flip uh, the spins on neighbouring sites if they're all pointing up. Therefore, we just have the icing term. We know those correspond to product states, uh, the lowest energy of which is the fully aligned ferromagnetic state. And indeed, we can write down the energy, nj upon 4. If j is less than 0, this is actually the ground state. It's the state with the minimum energy. This tells us that as we go to very low temperatures, T approaching absolute zero, um, this state will be the one that's picked out of the thermal ensemble, and the magnetization of the system will become equivalent to the magnetization of this st state. Since this state is fully polarized, we'd expect the system to gain a macroscopic magnetization. However, we have to be a little bit careful because, of course, we have SU2 rotational symmetry in this problem, and this ferromagnetic state uh, that I've written down here is not the only one in the ground state manifold. The axis along which all of the spins can be aligned um, can be chosen arbitrarily anywhere in three-dimensional space. So the down, 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 down state is of course also an eigenstate. And with exactly the same logic as we explored on the previous slides, we can take any linear combination of these states and it will be an eigenstate. If we were to consider, therefore, the expectation value of the macroscopic magnetization, which is the expectation value of the total SZ, uh, we'd expect all of these contributions to cancel out and give us uh, a zero magnetization as temperature goes to zero. As we'll see in the coming lectures, this is not really what happens, because in reality, um, we have a broken symmetry situation where nature picks out a single spin direction. This is the consequence of a phase transition, and of course that means that the system will develop spontaneously a macroscopic magnetization. This is of course what happens in materials like iron, which do have a permanent magnetization. We will be discussing these concepts of spontaneous symmetry breaking and quantum phase transitions in the coming lectures. Let's have a look instead at the J greater than zero case. We can write down the antiferromagnetic Neal state up, down, up, down, up, down, and so on. However, this is clearly not an eigenstate of the Heisenberg spin model in one dimension. We can verify that simply by applying the Hamiltonian operator to this state. Due to the icing term, we get the state back again, times uh, the constant minus nj upon 4, according to the same logic that we developed on the previous slides. However, the spin raising and lowering operators in the second term and third terms here uh, are not so simple. Here we see that we generate uh, other kinds of states involving a spin flip on nearest neighbours. For example, in this state we see that the initial up-down configuration has been flipped to a down-up configuration. And then we have a kind of domain wall in the spin texture because we have two ups sitting next to each other. Likewise, in this second ket here of our superposition, uh, we have the spin flip occurring on uh, these pair of sites. So we have two domain walls, an up-up and then a down-down. In the third one, we see a similar kind of thing, where the spin flip is happening progressively further and further down the chain. So in the end, we will have a zoo of terms here involving this uh, extra spin flip occurring at some point down the chain. The antiferromagnetic nail state is clearly therefore not an eigenstate. To find out what the ground state of the system is for j greater than zero, we'd have to do something more subtle for example, we could again resort to the computer, form uh, the Hamiltonian matrix in our many particle basis, uh, diagonalize that, and then see what the lowest energy states look like. As before, though, uh, we're limited here by the maximum size of the matrices that we can diagonalize on a computer. In fact, uh, we can have a look at the correlation functions again to gain some more insight here. For j less than zero, we found uh, the, the ground state if we were to calculate the correlator 4 times si z si plus d z, we would find this is equal to 1 independently of the separation between the spins d. This corresponds, of course, to magnetic long-range order. On the other hand, for j greater than 0, um, we don't just have this antiferromagnetic state uh, here being the ground state. Computational studies, and indeed more sophisticated treatments of this problem, reveal, however, that the correlation function in this case um, is not simply 
the staggered magnetization minus 1 to the d, which is the result that we saw in the longitudinal field uh, icing model. What we do find, however, numerically, is that the disorder in the system only sets in on exponentially long length scales. So there is still some sense in which we can refer to the ground state of such systems as being antiferromagnetic. We will return to this problem in the context of spin wave theory in the next lecture. In the last part of this lecture, I want to discuss the famous quantum to classical correspondence. The quantum dynamics of a system in d dimensions turns out to be equivalent to a classical system in one higher dimension, d plus one dimensions. This is because the quantum fluctuations in time of the quantum system are mimicked by spatial fluctuations in the extra dimension of our classical system. So I want to show this and discuss it in the following. So first, let's consider a classical system of spins. Here, I'm denoting the spin variable by the label sigma, which can be just plus or minus one only. These are discrete variables. They do not have the continuous rotational symmetry in three-dimensional space of a quantum spin that is described by SU2 symmetry. The states of classical spin models are, of course, product states. They're not quantum mechanical superpositions. Let's write down some prototype classical spin model. I'll denote that HC here, uh, the C for classical. This classical spin model involves a sum over sites of our system I, and then sigma I times sigma I plus one. So it's a one dimensional chain. But notice that these objects sigma I and sigma I plus one here are not operators. We see there's no hats on any of these objects. In quantum mechanics, of course, we have uh, operators for the spin components Sx, Sy, and Sz, which are not commuting. And that, of course, furnishes all of the rich physics of those quantum systems. In the classical model, we don't have that. We simply have these terms corresponding to the configuration of a given spin, either up or down, plus or minus one, and that's it. The classical model that I've written down here is, of course, in one dimension. Let's now consider a quantum spin model. Actually, I'm going to consider a model of a single spin. One can think about this as basically being in zero dimensions. I just have a point particle located at a given point in space. The Hamiltonian is given by minus h times the operator Sx hat. h is the transverse magnetic field. And Sx hat can be written, of course, as s plus plus s minus for the spin. In the basis of up and down spins for the quantum system, I can actually form a Hamiltonian matrix for the quantum system, HQ matrix. And this is given simply by minus H times sigma X, where sigma X here is one of the Pauli matrices. In the basis of up and down states, this is the one we want, is simply 0, 1, 1, 0. What I want to show in the following is that there's a connection between this classical 1D model, as I've written down here, and this quantum zero-dimensional model, as I've written down here. The quantum to classical correspondence is more general than this. It's a connection between a quantum system in D dimensions and a classical system in D plus one dimensions. However, the illustration here will be most simple for the case with a zero-dimensional uh, quantum system and a one-dimensional uh, classical system. So let's start with an analysis of the classical 1D model, and I've written it down again here. I'll assume that J is less than zero, and we're going to focus on the ferromagnetic solutions. At T equals zero, we have two distinct but degenerate ground states. I'll denote these with this double up arrow and the double down arrow, and here I'm going to use this notation that looks a bit like a quantum mechanical ket, but instead of the angle bracket here, I'm going to use this uh, round bracket to denote that this is not a quantum mechanical ket, but really just a classical configuration of spins. So this is just a notation uh, I've introduced here to distinguish it from a classical ket. So I have the up, 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 up state, which is uh, the lowest energy state of our classical 1D model, but it's degenerate, has the same energy as the down, 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 down configuration. Notice that unlike the quantum case, uh, we just have two states, 
there's not a continuous rotation in three-dimensional space. We literally just have the up or the down state. These are unique states. I cannot take linear superpositions of these two states and find another state. We don't have superposition states in the classical world. So let's now consider the stability of these ground states with respect to thermal fluctuations at a temperature greater than zero. I could consider these kind of states, these are classical spin configurations, where I have all but one spin pointing up. One of the spins is pointing down. In this first example, I have uh, the second spin here pointing down. And in the second example, I have uh, the down spin somewhere else uh, in the middle of this configuration. These states are related to the ground state by a single spin flip. The excitation energy, delta E, of these excited states above the ground state can easily be seen to be 4J from the Hamiltonian here. The classical thermal population of these excited states is therefore proportional to the classical Boltzmann factor, which is E to the minus beta delta E. Beta here is the classical inverse temperature. That means 1 over KBTC. And I will label the temperature with a subscript here, TC, to indicate that this is the temperature of our classical system. In particular, we see that at low temperatures, these Boltzmann factors are small, and would expect the statistical weight of these states to be small. On the other hand, there are a great many of these excited states. We can have these spin flips anywhere in this chain. Therefore, we should use the thermodynamic free energy F as a measure of the stability of this system. The free energy F is defined as U minus TS, where U is the internal energy and S is the entropy. T is, of course, the temperature, I should write here TC, really, the temperature of our classical system. So at temperature T greater than zero, we do expect to get thermal fluctuations of the spins. This is because we have a great many of these excited states, and therefore, uh, even though we lose out in terms of the uh, excitation energy, which is the internal energy, we gain in terms of the entropy. So the punchline of all of this is that in our classical 1D model, at finite temperature, defined by this uh, uh, Tc here, or equivalently inverse temperature beta c, we expect to see a proliferation of these spin-flip excitations. These excitations are occurring in real space. As you can see, we have a spin flip occurring at some point down the one-dimensional chain. Let's now have a quick look at our quantum zero-dimensional system. Here again is the Hamiltonian in terms of our quantum spin operator Sx. And we'll look at the physics at a temperature Tq. This is the temperature of our quantum system. Equivalently, I can write the inverse temperature of our quantum system beta q as one over kb. TQ. Because the operator Sx hat acting on the upspin creates the downspin, and Sx hat operating on the downspin creates the upspin, we expect to see in this system some uh, temporal fluctuations of the spin, meaning that we expect to see spin flips occurring as a function of time, even though the spatial extent of our system is only zero dimensional. Unlike the classical system, even as TQ goes to zero, we still expect quantum fluctuations of the spin in this system. So the main concept is that we can view the thermal fluctuations of a classical system in space at a temperature Tc as a sequence of quantum fluctuations in time of a quantum system at a different temperature Tq. So imagine our single spin of our quantum system. I can imagine the quantum fluctuations as a sequence of spin flips in time so the spin is initially up, then it remains up for a while longer, and then it gets flipped to down, and then it gets flipped to up again, and then down, and then it remains down for a while, and then it gets flipped to up, and so on. These are spin fluctuations in time. Meanwhile, for our classical system, which is a one-dimensional spin chain, I can imagine a particular spin configuration denoted by this state here. There I have in space, up, up, down, up, down, 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 up, up, down, and so on. These are spin fluctuations in space. The idea is that we can mimic the quantum spin fluctuations in time of our quantum system by these classical thermal spin fluctuations in space. But how do we do this in a concrete way? We need something more than just words here. 
In fact, the precise connection between the quantum and classical systems is achieved through classical statistical mechanics and time-dependent quantum mechanics. In particular, we wish to show that the partition function of the quantum system in d dimensions is equal to that of some classical system in d plus 1 dimensions. And that's what I want to show in the following. In quantum mechanics, we can time evolve a given state in the following way using the operator e to the minus iht. The Hamiltonian h hat therefore determines the quantum dynamics of the system. It tells us how these states evolve in time. The amplitude for a state to evolve for a time delta t and then return to its original state is therefore given by this object. This can be regarded as the expectation value in the state psi of the operator e to the minus i h delta t. The probability amplitude or expectation value that this happens for all states is therefore given by the sum over all states of the expectation value in a given state. But this is actually the same expression as that of the partition function of a system, where i delta t is replaced by the inverse temperature beta, which is 1 over kbt. Therefore, we see that inverse temperature beta actually plays the role of a kind of imaginary time, i delta t. This is referred to as a wick rotation. We replace i delta t by an imaginary time delta tau. In passing, I'll note that the Schrodinger equation actually becomes a classical diffusion equation after the wick rotation. This now leads to the imaginary time path integral expression for the quantum partition function. Let's take a closer look. Consider a partition function for some quantum system denoted z. This can be expressed as uh, the sum over eigenstates x involving these bras and kets onto the eigenstate x sandwiched between the operator e to the minus beta h. For an eigenstate x, this will then give e to the minus beta times the energy of that state x. The sum over all such states will give the partition function. As we showed in the previous lectures, this is equivalent to writing the trace of the matrix representation of this operator. If we now let the inverse temperature beta become n times the imaginary time step delta tau, which is equivalent to just separating our uh, total time interval into n imaginary time slices, then I can express the partition function in this way. Here I've replaced the operator e to the minus beta h hat by e to the minus n delta tau h hat. And then I factorize this by taking the, uh, the n out of this exponential as an overall power. The fact that I have this operator now to the power of n means that I can repeat it n times. So I expand my partition function in n imaginary time slices. I replace the usual Boltzmann factor, but replace the beta by n delta t. Then I separate out the exponential into factors, each containing e to the minus delta t h hat, and I have them n times. All of that is sandwiched between our bras and kets for the eigenstate x, and then we're summing over all states x. Next, recall that we can resolve the identity. This means that we can write the identity operator, 1 hat, as the sum over x onto a projector for state x. Because this is equivalent to just multiplying by the number 1, I can actually insert this identity operator in between these exponential factors, and I can actually do that n times. When I do that, I get something that looks like a bit of a horrible expression. I find that z is equal to the sum over x, but now I have uh, additional sums corresponding to each of, of the identity operators that I inserted. So I have a sum over, let's call it x1, x2, x3, and so on. Then when I insert that on the right-hand side, I have uh, here a matrix element now between uh, eigenstates x1 and x of the operator, and then another matrix element here between eigenstates x2 and x1 of the same operator, and so on. Eventually, I end up uh, by closing the expression with the ket x, and that's because we see x appearing here. The uh, partition function that we started with was the trace over all x. So this is just a mathematically exact way of writing our operator e to the minus b to h in terms of n operators uh, e to the minus uh, h delta tau, where delta tau is an imaginary time slice, we have n of these things, 
and I'm writing that now in terms of matrix elements of these operators in the eigenbases. To do that, I have to insert the identity operator, and therefore I get a whole bunch of sums here. This can be interpreted physically as saying that the time evolution of a state back into itself in a certain amount of imaginary time can be separated up into these uh, time steps. We consider first starting with a state x, then we time evolve it to a new state, uh, xn, then uh, we evolve it uh, forward again in time, and so on. So each of these matrix elements corresponds to, corresponds to stepping forward in imaginary time by an amount delta tau, and eventually, after n such steps, we get back to our state x. So we accomplish the time evolution here uh, in n discrete steps. But imagine taking n goes to infinity, then we'd have a continuous time evolution. And this is the path integral. So what we've shown here is that the quantum partition function, which can be written as the trace of e to the minus beta h, can be expressed in terms of these imaginary time slices, uh, delta tau, as the trace of e to the minus delta tau h um, to the power of n. We have n such of these time slices. If we make n very large, that implies, for a finite time step, that delta tau will be very small. And if we have e to the minus something very small, we can do a Taylor series expansion of the exponential operator. So as n goes to infinity and delta tau goes to zero, we can replace the operator e to the minus delta tau h hat um, by its uh, Taylor series expansion, which I'll cut off after the first term. I'll also write the right-hand side here in its matrix representation. So I have the identity uh, matrix here, minus delta tau, which is uh, very small, times the Hamiltonian matrix. For our zero-dimensional quantum mechanical spin system, comprising just a single spin, we wrote down earlier that our Hamiltonian matrix is just this two-by-two two object. It's actually the uh, Pauli matrix sigma x multiplied by the magnetic field strength uh, minus h. So we know for our simple quantum system that we can express the partition function as the trace of this operator to the power of n, and I have here a simple approximation for this operator. We're going to return to this expression later when we compare it to an equivalent classical system. What I now want to show is that we get exactly the same partition function here for our one-dimensional classical system. We can then compare the expressions for the partition function and make concrete the comparison between our quantum system and our classical system. So let's now go back to our d plus one dimensional classical system given by this uh, classical Hamiltonian here. We'll actually also use a simplification of periodic boundary conditions. This means that in our sum that runs over i from 1 to n, we see here um, the value i plus 1. What we'll say is that this wraps around and goes back to being spin number 1. We can therefore con consider this to be a ring rather than a chain. For example, if we imagine a system with eight spins, then we can arrange this in a kind of ring like this, where each uh, line here denotes the coupling between neighboring spins. We have an interaction between spin one and two, two and three, and so on, um, up to seven and eight. And then eight wraps around and connects back to one. So that's what we mean by these periodic boundary conditions. This is convenient because it eliminates edge effects and all of the sites in the system are now equivalent to each other. There's like a kind of translational symmetry around the ring. We can then write the partition function in this form. This might look a little bit alarming, but let's just take it step by step. What we see here is in these initial set of sums is the enumeration of a given basis state. So for example, we consider a, uh, a state with a particular spin configuration. These are denoted by the set of these sigma i's sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, and so on, all the way up to sigma n. These sigma i's can take values of plus and minus 1. So if I have the sum over sigma 1, sum over sigma 2, and so on, all the way up to sigma n, then this is basically enumerating all possible spin configurations of our system. And when I sum over them all, I get the partition function. The thing that I'm summing over are the Boltzmann weights. That's e to the minus beta h where h is, uh, of course, giving us the energy of this classical state. So I have e to the minus beta j in this case, and then I have to work out the contribution for that given state. And this involves the sum over i from 1 to n of these neighbors, which is given by this. So once I know a given configuration, 
denoted by these uh, set of sigmas, um, I can compute the energy for that state uh, by this term. I take e to the minus beta j of that thing, and then I sum over all possible states. It looks a little bit complicated, but it's just the closed form expression for the partition function of a classical system uh, described by this classical Hamiltonian. I can also write this in a slightly different form. I write the exponential here of the sum in terms of the product of individual exponential factors. So this is e to the something plus something plus something else. I can write that as e to the something times e to the something else and so on. That's denoted by this uh, capital pi here, which is the symbol for a product. So we have a bunch of sums which enumerate all the possible classical spin configurations. And then for a given one, uh, we take the product of these exponential terms. Now, the trick is that if you stare at this expression long enough, you can see that it's actually equivalent to a trace over a matrix product. This matrix T here, which we raised to the power of n before taking the trace, is the so-called transfer matrix. In this example, it's given explicitly by this two by two matrix, which has elements e to the minus beta j, e to the plus beta j, e to the plus beta j, and e to the minus beta j. So if we were to take the matrix product of T with itself, n times, and then take the trace, you can easily show just by usual properties of linear algebra that that would give this expression here. Uh, and that's of course then the partition function of this classical system. I can, of course, decompose any 2 by 2 matrix into the Pauli matrices. Here I'm just factorizing out a common factor of e to the minus b to j. And then I multiply that by the 2 by 2 identity matrix plus some constant here e to the 2 b to j times the Pauli matrix sigma x. That's exactly equivalent to this thing. Then when we take the matrix product of this n times, I'm going to get some constant factor here e to the minus n b to j times this thing to the power of n. So the form of our partition function for our one-dimensional classical spin chain is now very similar to the form of our quantum partition function for our single quantum spin. Let's compare them. So for the quantum system, we have a quantum Hamiltonian matrix for our single spin in the transverse field. It's given by minus h times the Pauli matrix sigma x. We're going to look at the partition function at an inverse temperature beta q. The partition function of the quantum system, let's denote it zq, is as usual the trace of e to minus beta q h hat. But here we're going to let the beta q be n times delta tau. Delta tau is going to be a small imaginary time slice. Putting that in the expression and doing the Taylor series expansion, um, we find that the quantum partition function can be given as the trace of this object, the two by two identity matrix plus delta tau h Pauli matrix uh, sigma x all to the power of n. So that's the situation for a single quantum spin. Now we turn to our classical one dimensional system of classical spins. The Hamiltonian is given by this expression and we're going to look at the physics of this at inverse temperature beta c on our classical system. The corresponding classical partition function zc as we showed on the previous slide, can be given by the trace of the transfer matrix to the power of n. And this is for a system of n sites. This transfer matrix is proportional to the two by two identity matrix plus e to the two beta cj times the Pauli matrix sigma x. And of course, we now see that these partition functions are basically the same up to some trivial multiplicative constant. Because the two partition functions are the same, we get the same physics in these two systems. One is a zero dimensional quantum system, a single spin. The other is a one dimensional classical system, a chain of spins. Comparing the two expressions, we see that delta tau h must be equal to e to the two beta cj. But don't forget that we introduced delta tau here in terms of uh, the original inverse temperature of the quantum system beta q. In fact, delta tau is precisely beta q over n. This tells us that the size of our classical system, n, must be equal to beta q h e to the minus 2 beta c j. And this is an interesting expression. In particular, let's see what happens as we go to zero temperature in our quantum system.
zero temperature in our quantum system, of course, means that beta q tends to infinity. And from this expression, we'd see that uh, the size of the classical system must therefore diverge. To capture the zero temperature dynamics of our quantum system, we need an infinite one-dimensional classical system. And in general, the classical icing chain has the same partition function as our quantum zero-dimensional spin when the system size is proportional to the quantum inverse temperature. So this is a rather deep connection. It tells us a connection between classical physics and quantum physics. We can regard quantum fluctuations at a given temperature in terms of thermal fluctuations of a classical system in one higher dimension. We proved for this simple example that these two systems really have exactly the same partition functions. Therefore, they really have the same physics. This quantum to classical correspondence has actually been used many times in theoretical physics to really do calculations on quantum systems by simulating classical systems in a higher dimension. For example, one can look at the quantum 1D model and simulate it with a classical 2D model. What we've seen here is that quantum fluctuations, even at zero temperature, can be regarded as a kind of classical system with thermal fluctuations, at least on the level of their statistical mechanics, as embodied by these partition functions. I think this is a really interesting and deep connection, and it's actually a useful one to have in the back of your minds when considering the physics of quantum spin systems. In the next lecture, we're going to consider models of an infinite number of spins on some given lattice, and the spin wave theory of ferromagnetism in these systems. This is a rather different approach than the ones we've considered hitherto. It's an approximate technique, but it's one that gives deep insights into the magnetism of materials, in particular the collective excitations which give rise to magnetism, which are called magnons. So that's to come in the next lecture.